Yeah, I mean, today I'll be talking about large eddy simulations, but I think that the, the bigger the bigger topic will just be how scientific machine learning and um, all this stuff with differentiable programming leads to uh, improvements in, in in the software for large eddy systems and, and what some of the interesting kind of, you know, compilery issues that go on when you're trying to do differentiable programming in the context of climate science. Um, so, so a lot of this is, is based on the software that's built by the SIMO open source uh, organization. So I'll be mentioning things like differential equations at jail that has, you know, GPU compatible high performance differential equation solvers, but also these tools like the FEQ Flux that allow these interfaces for solving inverse problems and modeling toolkit is an auto code optimizer and how all these things kind of play together to, to give you the, 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 the examples I show here. Um, so, so the, the key, the, the key high level is that, you know, scientific machine learning is this model based data efficient machine learning, right? So it's, it takes this idea of, you know, models themselves are a source of data, right? It, it must have taken multiple experiments to be able to say that this model is correct. And so in some sense, it's a stand in for a lot of the information that people have gathered in the past. So, so what we want to do with scientific machine learning is we want to use all of our physical models, all of our biological models, all of, you know, all these models that we have generated and use them as a complement to the data that we have within these machine learning architectures. So, so the, the real issue is then is how do we structure, you know, all of this numerical knowledge and also scientific knowledge in a way such that it can be embedded as almost a prior into the way that we're doing machine learning. So that way we get to our end goal of fast predictions uh, much, much faster and with less new data, right? Um, so, you know, the, the, one of the main things I've been looking at in this context is high fidelity surrogates of, of ocean columns, right? So if you take one of these little boxes, um, you know, it when, when, when generating one of these climate models, it really comes down to you have to be able to find out how the a how the ocean mixing occurs within one voxel, and then you have to have that voxel be you know repeated all the way around the Earth, however many times. Um, and you don't really need a very, very high fidelity, right? You know, we can we can run these large eddy simulations in 3D and everything, but you, you can't do that if you're going to be running thousands of them at the same time, all where they're just one little piece of the full climate model, right? So, you know, when, when we're talking about the MIT Caltech uh, clima, uh, clima model, which is being fully written and generated in Julia, the real question is, how do we take one of these high fidelity descriptions of the ocean column and turn it into something that it can be simulated much faster. And one of the ways that people do this, right, and a lot of people in this group probably know, it's called the ocean parameterization problem, finding out, finding a one-dimensional partial differential equation, which approximates the three-dimensional uh, Navier-Stokes equations with the Boskinesque approximation, right? So, so how can we do this? Well, the way that we're approaching this is to not use just the um, we're not using just machine learning and we're not using just the parameterizations that people have derived. We're using a mixture of them. So here, for example, is the convective adjustment of approach where if you, if you're to take a horizontal um, integral, like uh, integrate out the X, Y plane in, in the Boston S approximated uh, Navier Stokes, then what you get is a 1D advection equation without this neural network yeah, that, that then you, you can find this convective adjustment, which is essentially how th this line kind of propagates, you know, th this straight bar kind of propagates over time, right? Um, it's not entirely correct, though. I mean, because anytime you do one of these model order reductions or one of these closure terms, right, you're, you're cutting out some of the physics, right? It would really have to be described in an in infinite dimensional set of uh, 1D partial differential equations, but it kind of captures a lot of the behavior. And so what we can do though, is we can say, well, there's an error in our closure term and we can capture that error with the neural network. And we can then train that neural network against the original 3D simulation data, then be able to generate a more compact description of the model that is still pr uh, parameter dependent. Um, um, and, and so what we can do then is we can say, well, the, there is a missing term of the flux that, that, you know, and we actually then take the data along the, the, the Z axis and we say, okay, we have to match the average flux, um, you know, subtracting out the, the terms that we, that we know should be kind of there from, from the, from the closure terms. Um, we get what, what we're missing as, as this residual term, and then we can make the neural network be trained against the residuals. Um, and you can see that this does okay, right? It, it learns it learns to be something kind of like the flux and, and, and kind of give you uh, 
decent predictions, but it, it's not completely uh, doing well, right? Um, and why is this the case? Well, the, 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 the reason for this, this mismatch, right? And this is the common way that people are doing machine learning within climate models. The reason, the reason for this issue is that we're trying to train the neural network separately on derivative data, and then trying to say, does this actually get you the correct integral, right? Um, I mean, if, if you know from control theory, we're basically saying, can we control the derivative to be able to get the correct integral? And that is just not a process that ends up actually being stable. So what we can do instead is we can say, well, let's try to fit the neural network within the simulator. So instead of doing the neural network fitting as a separate process, as the same process of solving, we can let the, the loss function for our neural network be, we'll solve the differential equation with the neural network embedded within it, and then minimize the distance between the neural network-based solution, you know, the, this, this universal partial differential equation solution, and the data that's coming out of the 3D partial differential equation full simulator, right? Um, and then we can do this over different parameters to be able to capture different ocean columns and predict what would happen at a new ocean column. And you can see that we can get some very high fidelity predictions. Um, the, the lowest error one here is the one that says neural differential equation embedded um, version of the convective adjustment. It's able to beat out all the different parameterizations that we looked at along with beating out just that, you know, machine learning on its own and machine learning trained separately approach, right? And, and the, real, the real case here, what's, what's really going on is that it's, a, it's only using the neural network to capture some of the residual terms. It's using a lot of the physics to make sure that it's still having a, a, a equation that is, you know, still very local in its derivatives. And a lot of those properties you'd expect to be true. Um, but it's also making sure that we're controlling the, the integral, right? But th this actually brings up a secondary question of, you know, if you're trying to train a neural network within a simulator instead of training it separately and putting it into the simulator, well, how exactly do you train said neural network inside of a simulator, right? Um, this poses a lot of software problems because now you have to say, well, I need my machine learning training framework to be somewhat equivalent to my climate model. Um, and, and so even if you did have a climate model in some something like Python or, you know, one of, the, one of these, you know, w widely used languages, one of the issues is that a lot of times these machine learning frameworks are not actually compatible with the language that they come from. And what, what, let me kind of describe that in, in some details here. So if you, if you actually look at what's going on with TensorFlow, right, TensorFlow variables are not the same as Python variables. You have to explicitly name that these are the things in a, in a computation graph, and you have to evaluate the computation graph because TensorFlow variables and TensorFlow functions are not necessarily equivalent to the, num, uh, the NumPy code or NumPy functions. And so if you had a climate model already existing, then you're kind of out of luck in, in this case. You have to do a code rewrite. Now, the, you know, TensorFlow is kind of the easy case because it has a static underlying graph, unless you talk about, you know, TensorFlow dynamic, which, which is then just very slow, right? The, the fast version has a static graph, which has the, this issue that you it won't work. Um, so what about something like PyTorch, right? Um, the, the issue with PyTorch is even though it can look like it is close to NumPy a lot of the cases, in a lot of the cases, it is actually different in its semantics. You know, it, it's different in the syntax in some cases, and in other cases, it's only semantically different. And so your, your floating point is, is actually completely different for some of these calculations, right? So, so in some cases, they'll implement different algorithms. A lot of these algorithms are actually better suited for, for machine learning. And so we found in some cases, like for example, in some of the convolution com uh, computations, it will automatically downsample to some lower precision arithmetic. Um, and so you have to be very careful if you're to try to apply these to a climate model. But what this means though, is that if you had a full simulator written in NumPy, you still wouldn't necessarily be able to make it work with PyTorch. It would be its own project, right? And, and so th this means that really th this idea of, oh, you just stick neural networks inside of your climate model and you train it against some data to improve it, it needs a little bit more than just the standard tooling. Um, and, and, and so what, what we really need to do then, is, what we really set out to do was make sure that we can have a fully differentiable programming language. So that way we can take the existing MIT Caltech, you know, Klima climate model and make it be the, uh, the differentiable climate model that we can train neural networks within. Um, you know, so that way, if the entire programming language itself is the machine learning framework, then there is no extra work to be done here. Um, 
So, so one of the one of the main things reasons why their compatibility is kind of required to make this work out well is because there's just different things that we care about than people who do machine learning frameworks, right? So if you think about, you know, JAX is one of these uh, Google, uh, Google based, uh, you know, machine learning frameworks, and there's been some buzz around neural ODEs and, you know, neural network uh, based uh, SDE solvers and such. But if you actually look at what, what happens for the integrators that we care about, right? Things that are able to handle stiff equations and partial differential equations. Um, these are, these are cases that have just been neglected in that area, right? So if you, if you look at the JAX library, right now you'll see that the the lasting issue actually this is now about um, nine months old at the and with without an update um, it's still at the fact that it's about 200 times slower than VODE from SciPy which VODE from SciPy is already a fairly slow in integrator and so we're talking about 10,000 times slower than something would someone someone would want to actually use on a, on a PDE right um, this is not necessarily an issue with the JAX developers, right? It's it's more so an issue with non-composability means having to rewrite every single tool. And so things which are not in the standard mantra of how you do machine learning, like a stiff ODE solver, tend to be neglected in these machine learning frameworks. And so composability between the language itself and the machine learning training is really fundamental for, for kind of fixing these issues that, that, that pop up uh, when you're trying to do machine learning embedded into this kind of climate science. Um, now, one, one of the things that you might try to do, you know, one of the things to kind of think about is, can you use a black box differential equation solver and define adjoints over it to be able to train the neural network, right? So what, what is an adjoint method? Um, the adjoint method is where you do something like solve for Forwards, and then you can solve backwards. Um, and then if you use this, this reverse ODE um, as a nice trick, it turns out that one of the is part of the ODEs that you get when you solve backwards are the ODEs that define the derivatives of the with respect to the parameters of your original ODE, right? So this can give you a way to be able to get the derivative of your solution with respect to parameters or derivative of the solution with respect to neural network weights. And so technically this will work on a, um, on a black box, uh, you know, and you can kind of look at more details in, in a paper uh, like the neural ODE paper. But now the, the reason why I say technically is because it has a lot of numerical issues you have to work out, which will show up in the climate model situations. So for example, um, we can actually just pull out the advection equation as a counterexample to where this, you know, hits, you know, infinite amount of error. Um, what, you know, as you most likely know uh, from 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 you know grad school or something, you know the on the advection equation, um, you need to discretize it in a way that you're moving upwind at all times, right? So this is the upwinding discretization, and so if you discretize the the du dx, you either have to choose uh, i plus one minus i divided by delta x or i minus i minus one uh, divided by delta x, right? You either choose forward or backwards. Um, and which one you choose is actually important. If 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 A is positive, then you need to make sure that you choose the going backwards one, right? This is the upwinding discretization. And if you choose the wrong direction, then you get unconditional instability, which you can prove with von Neumann analysis, right? Well, it turns out that this scheme that I just mentioned, where you solve forwards and you solve backwards, is necessarily going to be unstable under, under those conditions. Because what happens is if you are solving forwards with the upwinding scheme, then when you solve reverse, then your then your A is actually flipped, right? Remember that when you when you reverse equations, you have to do minus F. You solve the, the negative of the original ODE. And so if the upwinding discretization is stable and forward, then the, the downwinding record, uh, uh, you know, the downwinding scheme is what's stable in reverse. And so actually the, the code gen for, for keeping this as a black box, if you keep your ODEs the same, that scheme is actually unconditionally unstable. And so this kind of gives you this, what, what this really means is that you have to really make sure that you are using stiffly aware kinds of methods and, and not treating things as, you know, black box that are mathematically correct. They need to also be numerically correct in a way that is um, not having th this blow up in error. So, so where, where are we at right now as like a, you know, kind of little summary? Well, it, what, what we need to do is we need to stick neural networks inside of different, inside of climate models, but we can't really just treat things as black boxes with, with, you know, without disregarding these numerical issues. But we also had to make sure that we're rewriting our differential equation solvers um, into Python, Torch, et cetera, be, if, to differentiate them. So, so that th this kind of poses a, a major problem uh, that, that needs to be solved, right? 
Um, now, now this the, this issue though is solved within the Julia programming language by using a code generation technique. So, what we can do what we can do on Julia is say, well, differential equations jl is the differential equation solver package which has all these stiff ODE solvers and whatnot. And what we can do is we can use the underlying mechanisms of chain rules jl and Zygo to be able to do code generation and automatically build adjoints from the, the this ODE description. And by doing that, we can actually generate these stable adjoint methods. Um, which uh, on stiff ODE solvers to be able to make sure that they're going to be able to handle these kinds of partial differential equations. Um, the nice thing about this means that you can take an ODE, just the, the standard way you'd write it in the, in the language, and then put it inside of a machine learning training loop, and it will do the training with adjoints and backpropagations and everything for a way that would scale to large numbers of parameters. Um, now, now, the key, though, is that there's not just one way to do these adjoints. There, you know, All of the different ways of being able to do the adjoints have trade-offs, right? The one that I described before is the backsolve adjoint, which, which is kind of gaining popularity well, is, is by far the most popular in the machine learning sense, but its stability is, is essentially only for non-stiff ODE, ODEs. Um, we're, we have a preprint out that even shows that it has exponential growth in the air dependent on the, the largest eigenvalue of your Jacobian. Um, so, so, you know, but uh, it, it, even though it even though it is um, only applicable to some cases, it does have a, a good property that has O of one memory usage. And so there, there's all these different kinds of adjoint methods which have different trade-offs between how, how good they perform on non-stiff ODEs and stiff ODEs um, along with their memory usage. It, it's, it's actually very similar to how, you know, you have different ODE solvers for uh, stiff and non-stiff ODEs. In this case, now we have a, a bunch of different ODE solvers, around 300, um, mixed with these different different choices of adjoint techniques to be able to match all these different cases in terms of stability. Um, now, why not just use something that like an old C++ you know, code like, uh, like Sundials, um, which might have adjoints already in it? Well, the, the key is that actually within the adjoint equation, there, there's a cogen problem that you can solve here. And so this vector Jacobian product within the adjoint equations is something that um, you can use reverse mode. You can use reverse mode automatic differentiation or backpropagation to turn from an O of n to O of one calculation. And so, something that's reliant on uh, on numerical differentiation, like Sundials or Pet C, um, is actually uh, has this order of magnitude difference in in the computation cost of the adjoint because it's not able to impose the the, the um, composability of the reverse mode tool into the code that it's actually solving as as the generated. ODE. And, and so what this means is that, you know, you, you do have some codes that do have stabilized adjoints, right? The, these have existed for, for a while, but they don't necessarily have that extra layer of, of um, integration with the AD tools that are required to have the, you know, fully uh, efficient form of the adjoint definition. And so what we really have put together then is the first set that has something that is stable for these really large stiff equations, GPU compatible, MPI compatible, but also has as the most efficient forms of these adjoints implemented for ODEs, SDEs, delay differential equations, and uh, differential algebraic equations. Um, when you actually go in any benchmark it, you can see that there is a pretty large difference between this and something like the, the differential equation solvers in PyTorch or the ones in, in, in JAX. And, and the reason is because this has this whole ecosystem behind it that you know has been blooming for years along you know being able to show that, oh, it's you know been optimized against you know 50 times faster than the size. SciPy, MATLAB, DE Solve, right? These are optimized differential equation solvers that have now been made to be fully compatible with machine learning at a language-wide level, instead of trying to just re-implement small pieces uh, of the methods directly into a machine learning framework. And, and so what we could even show is that, you know, the, the case in, in a lot of these cases, we'll see that methods that are native to Julia, like QNDF, um, are able to outperform uh, CVODE, even when you give it the most optimized linear solvers and, and you know, make use of sparsity and everything. When, when everything is all said and done, a lot of these methods have been optimized more than something like the classic CVODE or, or RAD out and such. Um, and this is even excluding some extra things that we can do with the uh, sparse, with the uh, symbolics under the hood, where um, I'll leave it to these papers to show that you can get that about four times faster um, by, by using some special e-graph techniques. But yeah, so, so 
in conclusion, right, there, there's a mathematical mixture with the computational and machine learning problem here, which is that, you know, you have to really worry about the numerical analysis in order to make sure you're doing these, uh, uh, the, these adjoints correctly. And you have to make sure that that numer you know, that you do a compiler go code gen technique that is stable for highly stiff systems. And when, now that we have put this all together, there's many different applications that we've been applying this to. So the climate climate model is just one of these applications. You can watch some of my other talks to hear more about how this has been underpinning things like uh, the, you know, the Pfizer, uh, Moderna and Pfizer trials and things like uh, Kitty Hawk's uh, recent battery powered airplanes and a lot of work along the lines of energy efficient buildings with HVACs. So yeah, thank you very much.